Mark's Gospel. We're uh, coming towards the end of Mark's Gospel. Uh, we've only got a couple of chapters uh, left to go. And then we're going to be moving on to uh, a rather important book in the Bible. We're going to be working through the book of Isaiah. And uh, that's going to take us well, 66 chapters in the book of Isaiah. Uh, some people say that it's uh, written by two people, two different Isaiahs, uh, but the New Testament tells us that's not true. <coughs> Jesus quotes from both sections and attributes it to Isaiah. <coughs> so there is only one Isaiah. Uh, the first 39 chapters uh, deals with uh, Isaiah uh, taking the prophecy to uh, the Northern Kingdom, and, uh, and then the, the last 27 chapters are dealing with uh, Hezekiah, I believe. And so, uh, this is going to be quite exciting for us to go through. It's interesting, isn't it, that there are 66 books in the Bible, there's 66 chapters in Isaiah, there's 39 in the Old, and there's 39 in the first section of Isaiah, and 27 in the New, and 27. So it mirrors the whole of the Bible. And so it's so important that we understand this very uh, important book I don't know when it was the last time. Has anybody ever preached through Isaiah in the last 20 odd years? Can't think of it. I'm not looking at you. <laughs> I think you're the oldest member here this <laughs> morning. <laughs> oh, sorry, Craig, I was looking at the wrong one. <laughs> uh, so I think it's time, it's time that we went into the book of Isaiah. Uh, so that's coming up. But we're in Mark just this morning. So we're starting at verse 27. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he, gave, when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they drank from it. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the, that, that day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Jesus predicts Peter's denial. Uh, will, you will all fail, fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. Truly I tell you, Jesus answered, today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. They went to the place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here a while, while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Go a little farther. He fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, Everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon said to Peter, Are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Once more he went away and prayed the same thing. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. Returning the third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough! The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared with him. Uh, with him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests and teachers of the law and, and the elders. 
Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. Going at once to Jesus, Jesus said, Rabbi, and kissed him. The men seized Jesus and arrested him. Then one of those standing near drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. ear. Am I leading a rebellion, said Jesus, that you have come out with swords and clubs to catch me? <clears throat> Every day I was with you, teaching in the temple courts, and did, you did not arrest me. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. Then everyone deserted him and fled. A young man, wearing nothing but a linen garment, was following Jesus. When they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. May God add his blessing to this, his holy word. Well, this morning we're going to look at a faithful son. And the question to us this morning is, how faithful are we? How faithful are we? Are we like scattered sheep? Well, the battle belongs to the Lord. He is our good shepherd. This morning, do we realize that we're in a spiritual battle? See, everything that happens, happens in the spiritual before it manifests itself in the physical. And so we're in a spiritual battle and the war is raging. If you're sitting here this morning and you're thinking that you're quite comfortable, just sitting back and relaxing, thinking, oh, I've got half an hour, 40 minutes, 50 minutes to listen to Rob this morning. Then you're missing the point. We're in a battle. And in any battle, there's going to be casualties. People are going to get damaged. We could probably name some already in this church or have been in this church and they've been taken prisoner and they have been damaged because we're in spiritual warfare and if we don't see what is at stake we will fall on the battlefield we should be like uh, a well tuned army to do battle. But we need to know the enemy. And we need to know who's with us in the battle. Because the battle belongs to the Lord. Has anybody watched the uh, Tolkien trilogy? Lord of the Rings. It's quite long. But it's actually worth a, a, a watch. I've watched it once, I think. I've read the books. You've read the books? I've been to Abel. Yes. Yeah, I read the books back in when I was working down in London. Uh, I read uh, the trilogy. Uh, and yeah, it's really good. But if you've watched it or you've read it, uh, then you'll know that uh, in the last scene, the forces of evil are amassed against the good. Can you remember that in the film? They're all banging the, the shields and they're all marching. Thousands and thousands of them all marching in. And, and where we are in Mark's Gospel is what we see the forces of evil coming to bear down on this small group of disciples. When we look at the mass of the opposition, there's the Pharisees, there's the scribes, there's the Romans, there's Judas, all on the side of Satan. And then if you can just imagine the scene You've got all these Pharisees and the scribes and, and they've got Judas and all the Roman Empire and they're all bearing down and the camera then swings round and this one solitary man, Jesus Christ, standing in opposition to this satanic attack. In verse 27 it says, you will all fall away. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. 
See, Jesus is quoting from Zechariah 13, verse 7, and it's the descriptive of this whole passage. The scripture today looks at the prediction of the scattering of the disciples. It looks at the prayer of Jesus in the Garden of the Gethsemane. And it looks at the desertion of those closest to him. And we're going to look, I take a closer look. We're just going to focus in this morning on the shepherd this morning. And we're also going to have a look at the sheep who are tested and scattered. We're going to contrast those who aren't faithful with the one who is faithful. So our question this morning is, how faithful are we? How faithful are we? Well, why is Mark telling us these things? In one sense, he wants us to be humbled by them, and in another, to be comforted. And we're going to look at three things this morning. The shepherd predicts, and the sheep object. The shepherd prays, and the sheep sleep. The shepherd is arrested and the sheep scatter. So we look at three things. The shepherd predicts and the sheep object. The shepherd betrays, sorry, the shepherd prays and the sheep sleep. And the shepherd arrested and the sheep scatter. So let's go to the upper room and the picture, the scene there. Jesus is eating, he's breaking bread and he's sucking the wine. He then announces, one of you will betray me. So they're all gathered together, they're all round the table. They're celebrating the Passover. It's a good feeling. And Jesus announces to these guys that he's been three years with, one of you are going to betray me. Can you imagine the shock wave that went through that room. What are you going to, one of you are going to betray me. It was unimaginable. They'd all been with him. They'd seen and witnessed the amazing things that he'd done. How could anyone betray him? How easy is it for us? To betray him. Have we ever betrayed Jesus? Whenever we've done what we want to do, we betray him. Whenever we put our desires above his, we betray him. Whenever we want to do and set our goal here on earth, we betray him. Who's betrayed him? It's good that the leadership of the church there put their hands up really quick. <laughs> so Alexander's a bit reluctant to put his hand up because he's usually left <laughs> with his hand up. The evening wore on and it takes the eleven because Judas has already left and it takes them up to the Mount of Olives. He then drops the next bombshell. You will all fall away. Amazing. You will all fall away. There will be a mass desertion. Absolutely unbelievable. Jesus, we would never do that. But Jesus would only tell them what scripture had said 500 years before in Zechariah 13. What are you thinking just now? What's going through your minds right now? What are you thinking right now? Are you saying to yourself, I will never abandon you, Jesus. I will never leave you, Jesus. I will never stop following you, Jesus. I am your disciple. I will want to follow you for the rest of my days. I will never, ever fall away from you. Is that what you're thinking this morning? I'm in it for the long haul. Nothing would stop me following you, Jesus. Nothing would stop me following you. Well, that's what the disciples were thinking. When we look at the 
sheep. And especially in Palestine, the shepherd would live with his sheep. He would do everything for them. And they would know his voice. The relationship that the shepherd had with the sheep was an intimate relationship. He knew every sheep in his flock. He probably had a name for everyone. We Hamish man. And the, the thing is that Hamish knew Jesus' voice. He knew the shepherd's voice, not Jesus. He knew the shepherd's voice. And they had a relationship. But if anything happened to the shepherd, the sheep would just scatter. Because their focal point was on the shepherd. And they would just scatter. And Jesus is the good shepherd. And he will be struck. But who strikes the good shepherd? It says, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. The I here is God. God himself will strike the good shepherd. And once the shepherd is struck, the sheep will scatter. No matter how long, how convinced, how committed, how determined, they will scatter in a moment. Is that us this morning? Is that us this morning? Just because we've been faithful in the past doesn't mean we'll be faithful in the future. We need to keep close and short accounts with our shepherd. So how do we feel when we let Jesus down? When we deny his grace in our lives? When we disobey, when we knowingly sin against him, when we mess up, how do we feel? A classic example yesterday, wasn't it? We let our brother down, we left him at the cage, we went and fed our faces. We did feel a little bit of remorse when we got there and we were sticking this massive great hamburger in the chops. And we were thinking, where's Brian? <gasps> We've left him behind. Did we feel good about ourselves? <laughs> we actually felt guilty because we'd let our brother down. We hadn't taken him, we left him on the battlefield. Well, he needed to be there, right enough. <laughs> but, but see, what I'm saying is that what, how do we react? How do we react? How do we feel about our relationship with the shepherd when we sin against him? And you know, when we sin against each other, it's the same thing. Because he's in us. So whenever we sin against our brother or our sister, we're sinning against Christ and we mess up and then we feel guilt and shame. But how does Jesus react? In verse 28 he says, but after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. I will be restored in the resurrection and I will restore you in Galilee. Isn't that wonderful? They've scattered, they've denied him, and he says, I will rise again, and then I'll come for you, and I will restore you. Now that is hope for us this morning. If you sinned against him, if you're sinning against him, if you know that you're sinning against him, then there comes that point when you can recognize that he will restore you. He wants to restore you. He wants that intimate relationship with you. That's important. That is the hope that we have. That is the comfort that we have. That when we mess up, and boy do we mess up, 
We can put a nice gloss on it, but deep down, we mess up. Isn't it comforting to know? Isn't it good news to know that our souls can be restored? Even when we deny and desert Jesus? Well, how tall do you feel now? Humbled because your sin put him on the cross? Or comforted that he'll not forsake you? But how did the disciples react? They objected. Peter says, even if all fall away, I will not. I'm Peter. I'm your man. I'm the man. I'm not. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna do that. I will never, ever, ever, never, ever forsake you, Jesus. I'm your man. I'm standing here. You can trust in me, Jesus. I'm the one. I will never ever, ever forsake you. They thought they were stronger than they were. But in fact, they were weaker than they realized. When push comes to shove and the test hits us, it's then that we realize just how weak our faith is. You see, our faith is not in ourselves that makes us strong, but in the object of our faith is where the strength is. The object of our faith is in Christ Jesus and him alone, in Christ alone. Jesus knows our failures before we even do them. He knows when we will fail and he knows when we, uh, when we have failed. And he knows how many times we're going to fail. But his love for us is absolute. The shepherd is to lay down his life for his sheep. And so the shepherd prays. And the sheep sleep. When Jesus takes his disciples up to the Mount of Olives to pray, he gives us an insight into Jesus' soul and what's happening to him. He sees what is before him and there is fear. There's a fear greater than the crucifixion. The cup is the cup of wrath that God is going to pour out on him for the sin of the world. The his his whole sinless humanity flinches at this prospect. We can't, we can't get heads around that because we're sinners. He was sinless and took on our sin. And then the wrath of God was going to be poured upon him. We just can't get our heads around that. And so he asks the sheep to pray as he wrestles through prayer to obey what God has told him. And how many times have we done this when we pray through the night wrestling to obey his calling? Is, is that a reality? When was the last time we wrestled with prayer right through the night in order to obey what he's called us to? The disciples followed to the garden. Then he takes three further on and goes by himself to pray. He tells them to keep watch. He says, watch and pray. See, this morning, if, if there's just one thing you want to take from this, watch and pray. Do it. Watch and pray. Just have, those, just have that as a strap line. Put it on your mirror. Watch and pray. Watch and pray. Just keep going through that. Why? They're in a spiritual danger of falling into temptation and to abandon the faith. They need to watch and pray. He turns to the sheep three times to check on them. And guess what? They've fallen asleep. They're sleeping at the wheel. Dangerous. It's dangerous to sleep at the wheel. We've done it. Or I've done it. <laughs> Quite frankly. There's a time I was coming back from seeing a client up in Elgin, and I was just coming past King Ross, fast asleep, in the car, driving, on my own, three o'clock in the morning, because I'd done it in the day, driven up, seen the client, left the client at 10 o'clock, driving back down, fast asleep. And I drifted right across into the fast lane. And I think it 
was an angel. Because there was a bright light that woke me up from behind. I think it was flashing the light. I don't know. But I woke up and I was that far from the crash barrier. And was able to sort of pull it back. Watch and pray. Don't fall asleep. Watch and pray. Isn't it interesting that he returns to them three times? And Peter denies him three times later on that night. Isn't that interesting? Sleeping is a picture of spiritual weakness. Are we sleeping this morning? Are we having a wee spiritually? Keep watch, stay awake. Keep watch, stay awake. Yep, you're old. The disciples' intentions were good, but they can't stay faithful. The good shepherd stays faithful. Doesn't that humble us <coughs> this morning? That's why he's the shepherd and we're the sheep. He's the one who's faithful, not us. The disciples had nothing to say. They remained silent. When we are standing before Jesus, we have nothing to say when he reveals our weaknesses. We just stand in awe and humility. So the shepherd is arrested and the sheep are scattered. The kiss of a friend is the signal of betrayal. So painful that it must have hurt. So why did they come to Jesus in the night under the cover of darkness? They could have arrested him at any time and he was, uh, if he was truly guilty. But they came in dark, the darkness because he was an innocent man. There was a skirmish, but Jesus took control. He told the guard his hour had come. Jesus was in control. You remember through the Gospels, it's always said, my time has not come. The hour of my death is not here. That he kept putting it off and putting it off and putting it off because the time was not right. They couldn't touch him before this time. And now he says, this is my hour. This is it. The hour has come. You see, Jesus was in control of all the circumstances. Not the crowd. Not the Romans. Not the Pharisees. Not the scribes. The disciples scattered and Mark asked this bit of information. A young man ran naked. His robe was torn from him and he panicked and escaped. Some think that this might have been John Mark himself, but the text doesn't tell us. So why does he include this in here? I think it's here to show that we all have great intentions. We all say with our lips that we will follow Jesus and we'll take up our cross and that we desire to be like Jesus. But we find ourselves naked and ashamed, failing and running away, just like Adam in the Garden of Eden. We are no different. We can say a lot of things with our lips, but actions speak louder. We are, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. We are sheep scattered. We wander rather than stick together. The verse doesn't say at the end by saying, therefore, the Lord will punish his sheep. No, it finishes, and the Lord has laid on him, that's Jesus, the iniquity of us all. The good shepherd takes the blame for his bad sheep and burden, takes the burden of their shame. And he drinks the cup of wrath. How humbling is that? But how comforting is it? Do we see that we deserve condemnation? But Jesus, the good shepherd, stood in our place and took it for us. Doesn't that make you want to cry this morning? Jesus stood in our stead. He took the wrath of God in our place. Yeah, we mess up. We make mistakes. We're weak. We fall into temptation. We sin against him, and yet he says, come to me, for I have paid for that sin. That doesn't give us a carte blanche to go and sin. Paul tells us that in Romans. But we are to appreciate that all that he's done. 
And he did it because, this, because he loves us, and that's the bottom line. It's not out of something that we've done that deserves that love, because we haven't done anything that deserves that love. He does it because he loves us in a pure love. And that should humble us, but it should also comfort us. He was willing to go to the cross because he loves us. Where is she? Are you watching and praying? Where you fall asleep. Remember the churches in Revelation, the one who Jesus commends and doesn't rebuke? Those are the ones who are weak. I know you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. In the Sermon on the Mount, it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall inherit the kingdom of God. It's in our weakness and in our poverty that we recognize who he is and that the kingdom of God belongs to us. It's when the object of our faith, Jesus Christ himself, is front and center that we diminish and he grows great. Not in our strength, but in his. I hope this morning that you realize just what sin does to us. Sin taints us. Sin corrupts us. Sin defines us. Because we are sinners. I hear it so many times, but deep down we're really good. No, deep down we're really bad. Really really, really bad. And you see, the closer you get to the shepherd, the closer you get to Jesus, the more you see of the sinful nature that you have. You know, it's like putting something that's brilliant white against something that's white. The white looks grey to the brilliant one. And that's what happens when we get closer to Jesus. It reflects the filthiness of our heart. So we should feel humbled this morning that he was willing to take that filth upon himself. That that was pure and innocent and, and beautiful, Jesus Christ, took on the filth that is in our hearts upon himself to take the wrath of God upon himself. How much love is that? Would we do that for each other? Well, we should find great comfort in the fact that he will forgive us our sins. Recognize who we are and turn to him. Turn to him. Repent of the sin and keep a short account because he says because you've sinned, you're not condemned any longer. Because you're a sinner, you're no longer under condemnation. Because I died for you. I took the sin from you. And I replaced it with my righteousness. So when God looks at you, he sees Jesus. Not your sin. Because he took it from you. There should be a great deal of comfort this morning in knowing that your sins have been dealt with. So go and sin no more. And see when we do, get on your knees immediately. Immediately. Don't delay. Repent. And it's when you hate the sin that is true repentance. Because we like the sin too much that we want to hold on to. Let's pray. Lord and Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word this morning. Lord, we just like those sheep, just like those disciples, we find it so easily to say with our lips, we will always follow you, Jesus. We will always want to be like you, Jesus. We want to be your people. 
and separated out to be your people. And we will never leave you. We will never forsake you. We will always be there, just like Peter. It's not me, Jesus. I'm standing here right with you. And yet he denies him three times. Lord, help us not to deny you. Help us this morning to realize that this is bigger than us. Way bigger than us. And therefore it's all about you, Jesus. It's not about us. It's about you. And so Lord, help us this morning. If we are sinning against you, Lord, that we would take that immensely seriously. And we would turn to you. Turn from the sin. Turn to you, our good shepherd. Lord, that we wouldn't scatter, that we wouldn't fail, that we wouldn't fall away. But Lord, we would cleave to you. For that is the only hope we have, is in you and you alone. And so Lord, bless us this morning, in and through the precious name of Jesus. Amen.